welcome. Uh, welcome to the uh, AMA series uh, lecture series. Uh, my name is Thos Lund. For those who don't know me, I'm the vice president for science and education here at the museum. Before we start, I would like to uh, do a land acknowledgement. The field museum acknowledges that it resides within the traditional homelands of the three highest confederacy. The museum recognizes and is grateful for the original peoples who laid the foundation for the city of Chicago and for the diverse indigenous nations that reside in Chicago today. Today's talk is entitled Discovering and Preserving the Diversity of Life um, with DNA Barcoding. And I welcome three speakers today. So it's Leslie de Souza, Sophia Fick, and Bruno de Medeiros. Leslie is the lead conservation scientist here at the Keller Science Action Center. Sophie is a postdoc here at the museum. And Bruno is the Negoni Assistant Curator for Pollination Insects. They will talk about their uh, Walder Foundation funded projects and project entitled DNA Barcoding for Conservation. Science, training, and innovation to preserve the tree of life. We are very thankful for the generous support of the Walder Foundation for this and other projects here at the museum. Um, currently, two PIs, Leslie and Bruno, are leading this effort together with a number of scientists in all the three science uh, centers at the museum. And uh, a postdoc is involved in as well, obviously, Sophie. Um, we have uh, two years of uh, funding and we just ended the first year and we are very uh, eager to hear about the results of their projects. This is really the first uh, large eDNA program, eDNA standing for environmental DNA sampling, which is really an exciting new tool that became available for both research and conservation work. Uh, in this project, five paid undergraduate interns are being trained in science. We have four visiting scholars being funded and several international and national uh, field trips to places like Peru, Guatemala, Panama, Mexico, and two trips to Guyana. Can I join with one of these trips? Um, and we really hope that this is just the first step in establishing a strong program in eDNA here at the Field Museum. Thank you, and last week I ask you to. And thank you everyone for being here. And a special thank you to the folks from the Wilder Foundation who are here in the meeting. Uh, gave such a great introduction. I didn't anticipate all of that information, but we have the pleasure today of sharing progress on our Walter funded project uh, using DNA barcoding to preserve the tree of life. Like Corson mentioned, we are finishing year one. We're super excited to share kind of the results thus far. But in a few months, we're going to be embarking on a couple of uh, projects. And so please stay tuned because there's a lot more coming in the final year of this project. Uh, as Torsten mentioned, this is a huge collaborative effort across centers within the museum. So uh, also college institutions, sorry, Chicago institutions where interns and graduate students are receiving training and gaining experience here through this project, as well as our international collaborators from Central and South America. I want to start with these specimens that are from the Field Museum's fish collection. These were collected over a hundred years ago by Carl Eigenman in Guyana. He is a taxonomic, he was an expert uh, in collecting fishes all over the Neotropics, but made the most extensive collections of freshwater fishes in Guyana. And the majority of those specimens are right here in the Field Museum's fish collection, including the type specimens. So the specimens that are the physical representation of the described species. So, Anyone studying neotropical ethiology and fishes oftentimes have to reference this um, work by Carl Eigenman. Those collections 
in the early 1900s. This is a scene from scientific collections in Guyana at the time, where specimens were collected, prepared, and packed, and brought back for uh, experts to review and to study. And this way of documenting life on Earth is not very different from the way that we're doing them now. This is an exhibition <clears throat> in 2022 where we collected fishes in a place that Eigenman hadn't reached yet. And these are important collections, super critical to do important science, like updating the checklist for the freshwater fishes of Guyana that we were able to do last year, describing new species, as well as increasing the specimens and the collections that we have here at the museum. But even after 100 years of collecting freshwater fishes in Guyana, we still have gaps in our knowledge. This is a sampling density map of freshwater fishes from Guyana. And you can see that there are many places that we still know nothing about that we've not visited yet. And in a place like Guyana, where the government and the local people want to protect biodiversity, we don't have the data to optimize those efforts. This isn't just a Guyana problem. This isn't just a fish problem. This is worldwide across taxonomic groups. We need new tools to document biodiversity and monitor them long term. We need tools that can do this faster. What if we could sample, uh, sample in this river and know what's there? And not only the aquatic species that are there, but the terrestrial species that are <clears> in this <throat> environment. And that's what part of this project is doing. We're developing the methodology to use environmental DNA, which is traces of <clears throat> DNA in the surrounding environment from organisms. So that could be from feces, from mucus, from gametes, um, shed skin, any trace of an organism in that environment, we can collect in an environmental DNA sample and detect its presence in that locality. We're also, oops, we're also using the museum collections to develop these tools. So you'll hear from curator uh, of pollinating insects, Bruno Gimaderos, who is gonna talk about how he's testing DNA barcoding and egg artificial <clears throat> intelligence um, imaging on insects here in our collection to develop these tools in order to document biodiversity, but also the interactions between insects and flowers historically and in present time. We have an incredible, impressive new cohort of FEMA, uh, field museum scientists who have are fluent in this traditional way of collecting specimens in the field, which is still very important, and new technology. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about this first year of the work that we've been doing in this Wilder project, and they're in three broad categories. So the science piece is underneath the, um, is the environmental DNA portion of the work is underneath the science portion of this work. Bruno's work with the um, AI imaging and metabarcoding is within the innovation, and training overlaps both of these other categories as well. So I'd like to introduce the postdoctoral researcher on this, uh, the eDNA portion of this work um, in the Amazon Basin, Dr. Sophie Peake, who has come to us from Michigan State University. She has a uh, background and experience doing eDNA work in French Guyana. She's also worked with other groups of neotropical fishes, including electric fishes, which is super cool. Uh, and a small stint, I think, with marine fishes uh, while you were at Dry in Panama. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sophie Peake. Thank you. Um, thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to go over some of our progress on the science and training areas of our project. And as Leslie was mentioning, um, our science aim is to develop DNA methods to survey and monitor um, Amazonian hyperdiverse fish communities. Our hope is really to develop DNA sequencing as a reliable and community-wide monitoring tool that we can deploy in mega diverse um, environments, but also uh, potentially hard to access habitat. Um, and to integrate this tool into the rapid inventories that our science action and the Amazon team is conducting. So because eDNA refers to all DNA traces from all environments um, in the, uh, from all organisms in the environment, we've been growing the idea of using this tool not to monitor just the fish population, but also other vertebrates. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about some recent findings from our pilot study that we conducted in the Kankakee River here 
in Illinois successor eDNA methods um, and see how they can uh, be used to characterize the local vertebrate fauna. I'll also talk about our recent study in Guyana where we use eDNA methods to monitor the presence of a rare species. And lastly, I'll go over some of the exciting upcoming projects that we have planned in Peru and Mexico. And as I go through these, um, I will integrate the training opportunities that we've been able to have through these science classes. Our aim in the Kanki team was really to test the feasibility of eDNA sequencing in um, reconstructing the community composition of aquatic habitats with well-characterized diversity. The diversity in the Kankakee River is well known and also remarkable for North America. We know that it has six endangered and nine threatened fish species that you can see on this slide. Um, and this allows us to test how accurate eDNA methods are going to be at detecting species that are present potentially at very low <coughs> abundance. Another important point in Kankakee is that the DNA reference database for fish taxa um, is nearly complete. A reference database in eDNA is a collection of DNA barcodes for each species, meaning small genetic uh, fragments that have high variation between species that we can use for identification. And so with eDNA, we're trying to, um, we're targeting these barcodes in the water. And so eDNA studies are always more powerful with more DNA references. The map here illustrates the 11 sampling sites where we collected eDNA along the river continuum. And at, at each at three of these sites, we repeated eDNA sampling and conventional fishing techniques um, to compare detection. It was really important for us to try and do this, all the lab work at the field museum, as our goal is really to integrate this tool within the rapid inventory and make eDNA analysis a central part of how we monitor biodiversity but also a central part of how natural history museums worldwide catalog life on Earth. Um, and so in aquatic environments, eDNA generally uh, comes at very low concentrations. So when you bring these samples into the lab, um, these samples present similar contamination challenges as forensic DNA or ancient DNA. And so one key measure to minimize contamination is to process all these samples in a room that is physically isolated from another DNA lab space where you could have high copy number DNA or where you could handle tissue. So the first thing we did was what we set up a, a new lab space just for pre-PCR eDNA work, um, separate from the CRISPR lab with dedicated equipment and supplies where um, those supplies do not leave the room. Uh, we also have to protect the samples from potential human contamination. And so we're only opening these tubes and um, handling these samples under a positive pressure hood with HEPA filters and UV sterilization, a lot of bleaching too, um, to keep us from extracting our own DNA. Um, so the, the DNA extraction takes place in that room as well as um, the PCRs are assembled there. And for the Kankakee study, we use a single set of uh, vertebrate specific primers to try to detect all the vertebrate taxa in one reaction. So once um, this is done, the samples go through PCR amplification, we can start working in the CRISPR lab again with our wonderful staff there, Kevin and Dylan and Izzy. And so all the library prep was done at, um, in house. The sequencing also was done here on our MySeq machine, as well as all the bioinformatics. The creation of this eDNA lab space opened up a new opportunity for us um, for training. So we've been really happy to have Olivia, a master's student at DePaul uh, University, who's co-advised by Kayla, um, be able to extract her eDNA filters from the <laughs> in our lab space. So when we look at the results from our PNCC study, um, we were really excited to see that we detected 162 different vertebrate taxa. And with 79 taxa of fish, fish was really the class that we um, identified the most, followed by birds and mammals. Of all these taxa, 124 were identified down to the species level. That's roughly 75%, um, and about 23% to genus level. So when we look a little more closely at the fish results, it's clear that fish biodiversity was the most efficiently detected. 
Species from the order Cyperniforms dominated uh, the fish communities with 33 different taxa. Cyperniforms are the most species group of fish in North America, so this makes sense to us. And on the bubble plot here, what you can see is the presence of each of these cybernid taxon uh, by a blue dot. So each row is a, a different um, taxon and each column is the same. And so what I want you guys to take from this is that fish DNA was detected at all that site and that cyprinid DNA in particular was highly detected. We were also able to detect three state-threatened species, namely the um, starhead pavmino, mottled sculpin, and the river red horse, indicating that it is possible to amplify DNA that's present um, at low abundances. And uh, also detected three non native species, which are known to be invasive, namely the white perch, common carp, and goldfish. When we look at the other taxa, the most frequently detected birds were duck species. Again, that makes sense because ducks are going to spend most of their time in or near the water. And the most frequently detected mammals were rodents, with 15 different taxa of rodents. So let's take a closer look at me. Uh, we can see here that uh, muskrats and beaver DNA were detected at all sites, indicated by the pink arrows, which again is expected. These are abundant in Illinois. Uh, we also detected deer and raccoon DNA at all sites. What wasn't expected is that we detected um, armadillo DNA at two of our sites. Um, I'm not from Illinois, but I did not know that uh, armad armadillos were present in southern Illinois. And they're actually making their way up north. So um, that was a cool finding. And all this data just goes to show you that um, eDNA was highly effective at characterizing the fish communities, but also not necessarily aquatic animals. So, how did eDNA compare with conventional fish sampling methods? Uh, here you can see the number of fish species that were caught by traditional methods at all these different at these three sites, so between five to 10 species. And here in green, you can see the taxa that were only detected by eDNA, and then in yellow, the ones that were detected by both. So you can see pretty clearly that eDNA detected more species than conventional sampling methods in our study. Are we sampling enough? These are species accumulation curves that show the expected number of observed taxa as a function of sampling effort. The full lines are based on our data and then the dotted lines are in that extrapolation. What you can see is that the fish taxonomic richness is increasing way more rapidly than any of the other groups. And you can see that it's increasing and kind of reaching the plateau around 40 filters, meaning that more sampling would not necessarily lead to more um, species detected for fish. You can see that the curve for birds kind of tends to still be increasing, meaning that if we did amp up our sampling efforts, we could potentially detect more birds. Um, the curves for the amphibians and the reptiles reached a low plateau, indicating that more filters would not necessarily mean more species would be detected. Another form of control to make sure that we are detecting the taxa that is there with our field and lab eDNA methods is to sample a known community um, of taxa, known as a mock community. And lucky for us, we have a lot of these mock communities right next door at the Stetoferium. And so we've been really happy to collaborate with Alan LaPointe and Frank Oliaro there. Um, this has been also a great training opportunity for our Walter intern, Jessica Zong, who is interested in learning eDNA techniques. Um, so together, we've been collecting samples at the Stetoferium, and we're about to extract the DNA from there. Um, just to double check if we can really identify the species uh, from the tanks that we have. Jessica has also been working on the morphological and genetic diversity of hatchet fish, which is a group of South American fish, and generating DNA barcodes for, our, for, for all these species so that we can add them in our DNA records. Um, going back to Kankakee, I would just like to wrap this study up by mentioning that eDNA analysis can be really helpful and effective at understanding how diversity changes at the <coughs> landscape level. Um, and so this kind of data can be really intuitive and easily translatable into conservation action, which is really what we're interested in. So this idea that eDNA can help inform conservation leads us to our next project in the river community of Guyana, which is located in the southern part of Guyana. 
And the Rupununi is this incredible ecosystem of tropical savannas and wetlands. It's bounded by mountains and rainforests. And in the wet season, it forms this really rare connection between the Guyana Shield and the Amazon River. And so it allows for connectivity between two of the most biodiverse and intact forests in the world. So Inoy has really diverse fish um, fauna, but it's also an area of conservation concern for the local people. In an effort to help form a case for conservation in this area, our goal with this study was to use eDNA to detect the potential presence of an endangered species, namely the um, Amazonian river dolphin. So this is again an endangered species and it's not officially reported in Guyana. The map on the right illustrates their distribution. So they're known to be distributed um, to the neighboring, through the neighboring country of Brazil. Uh, but the local people in the Rukununi have spotted them uh, so know that they are potentially present, including our collaborators in South So this is the first eDNA study in Guyana. We were really excited to try and see if we could detect their target species, but with the same sampling effort and cost, um, we were able to go in and look at the entire um, vertebrate fauna, as well as test some of our eDNA methods uh, in directly in hyperdiverse environments. So we went there in January and sampled 20 sites uh, because it was the dry season at this point. We stayed along the main river channel um, and did a watershed level monitoring. The idea, however, is to go back during the rainy season, sample again, and see whether these mammals are using the flooded landscape um, differently. Uh, for now, I'll show you some preliminary results, um, but we did take this opportunity to test various filters to see which ones work better at maximizing detections um, and which ones are easier to work with. So we were really excited to find river dolphin DNA was detected at 12 out of our 20 sites. Um, this was a super important outcome for us. We got the species we were targeting, and this is potentially huge for the conservation of the species, but also the region as a whole. Um, so you can see again on the bubble plot, the, all the different um, sites where the river dolphin was detected. And uh, we were expecting some detections because at <clears> one site, <throat> while we were sampling, we did uh, happen to see them. Um, so I just want to show you guys what that looks like. I don't know how many of you actually saw them. <laughs> I say no. <laughs> but let's be hungry. The point is, they're really hard to, they can be really hard to see. They tend to be shy and elusive. They don't necessarily travel in big groups. And so they can be hard to see. Um, and so EJNA in this case is a really good tool for them. So what about the other taxa? In total, we detected 274 unique vertebrate taxa. Um, and again, as you can see on the tree, mostly a ton of fish, kind of the same pattern as can see, but even more fish, um, followed by mammals and birds. Um, approximately 55% of all taxa were identified down to the species level and roughly 30% to the genus level. So these are lower levels than for Kankakee, and it's mostly um, due to the fact that DNA reference databases in the neotropics are way less complete than in North America. When we look more closely at the fish results, we got some powerful detections. So we were able to um, detect a species that's endemic to the Rupununi, a catfish species. We were also able to discriminate between two closely related species of electric eel. Um, for the longest time, people, we, we thought there was one species of electric eel. Turns out there's three, and we were able to detect two of them at the same site, um, which was really powerful. Our data also identified gaps where we need to focus our efforts to understand the local diversity better. For instance, a lot of our sequences were assigned the taxonomy of terrestriform, that is at the order level. These are tetras. Um, they're, the, they're the equivalent of cyperniform in North America. So a lot of species, but we just don't have um, DNA reference database information for these species. And so we, this is an area where we do need to focus on work. 
<clears throat> when we looked at the mammal diversity, uh, we were able to detect a lot of non-aquatic mammals. For instance, for instance, we detected seven primate taxa, including um, the right faced spider monkey, which is a vulnerable species. We also detected other species of conservation concern, like the Amazon um, manatee that we detected at one of our sites, um, the South American tapir, and collared tapir. When we look at our species accumulation curves for Guyana, we can see again that fish <clears throat> taxonomic richness grew um, more rapidly than any of the other groups. And we can see that um, there's no real indication of reaching a plateau, meaning that more uh, sampling would definitely lead to more uh, taxa detection. And so a higher sampling effort and also efforts to build a DNA reference database would be really impactful in Guyana um, for this kind of study. So all of this work has been really helpful for us to tease out the methodology um, and kind of leading up to the work we really want to do in hyper-diverse environments. And in preparation for our focal work in the Amazon and other parts of the neotropics, Andrew Gallardo has been working on cataloging um, our, new, our backlog of neotropical fishes in the fish collection, as well as recently collected specimens. So to date, he has, um, gone through over 2,000 new records, which totals um, 9,800 specimens of fishes from Guyana, French Guiana, Costa Rica, Guatemala, um, and Suriname. So we've teased out some of this methodology um, with the, the pilot study and the smaller study in Guyana. So all of these projects are leading up to what's coming next, uh, which is sampling mega diverse Amazonian communities. And we're aiming to focus this work in the Yanguas National Park, which is located in northern Peru. Um, this park was created in 2018. It is in the heart of the Amazonian rainforest, located between the Putumayo and Amazon rivers. The Field Museum has a history of working in that region uh, with our Andes Amazon team conducting two rapid biological and social inventories there in 2003 and 2010. And it was estimated from these inventories that there are about 550 species of fish in the region, so that's huge. Um, it represents about 65% of the species of continental uh, fish of Peru. And this includes species of fish that are important in terms of economic um, value, but also new to science, um, like this new catfish species that was recently described with biological material from the inventory. So we're collaborating with partners from the um, National History Museum in Lima, the Peruvian National Park Services, and the University of San Marcos to work together and use eDNA and um, conventional fishing methods to monitor the Yaguas fish diversity. The traditional fishing sampling efforts are going to be really important here um, to start really uh, building a robust DNA reference database um, and to also discover potentially undiscovered text. This will also allow us to compare the diversity that was already registered in 2010 in the raptor inventory and to assess um, the potential effect of having this huge conservation area for the local fauna. And together with students from the university, we also plan to conduct the first assessment of aquatic invertebrate communities in the park um, as invertebrate communities weren't a part of the raptor inventory. One of our local partners there, Junior Chuktawa, will be coming to the museum as a Walder visiting scholar to work on describing some of the new species of the region. On the other end of the spectrum, we're also planning to use <coughs> eDNA and uh, to try and detect possibly extinct species of minnows in the last remaining lake of the Valley of uh, Mexico. So we're going to sample the two lakes that are at the bottom. Mexico City largely sits on top of that um, the big lake, and so a lot of them are dried out. There's been a lot of anthropogenic development. Um, and for one of these species, the Field Museum has the only specimen that was ever collected in the world. So this is the only way that we know this species ever existed. Um, we're going to do this in collaboration with um, Jairo Arroyave, who will also be a Walder visiting um, scholar. He's going to come here and work on the cryptic diversity of some northern um, catfish, northern neotropic catfish. So please stay tuned. There's a lot of really cool projects that are coming up. 
Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it off to Bruno, our curator of pollinating insects, who's going to talk about um, the innovation and training part of our And uh, so I'll take the last 10 minutes more or less to go over really quickly the innovation and training uh, aims of our, um, uh, our project. And uh, so Sophie has shown you already how we living organisms keep leaving our parts behind in the environment. And so we can use filters to, um, to collect those parts and detect them with DNA. And what I'm going to talk about filters, but flying filters that are uh, going around and touching things and being touched by them, uh, such as this monarch butterfly uh, that, uh, that is using flowers. And, um, uh, and I'm also showing a detail of the head of another kind of butterfly with a, a lot of, uh, with, with a yellow dust on its head, which is pollen from the plants where, uh, which these butterflies have visited. And uh, just like we extract the particles from a filter and we can do uh, DNA extraction and, uh, uh, and barcoding, we can do this with the, the, the pollen and other debris on the body of insects. And uh, you might be very familiar with monarch butterflies, but you not, might, might not be very familiar with the other hundreds of thousands of species of insect pollinators that are out there. Actually, no one is familiar with them. This is the uh, most recent attempt at estimating the numbers of insect species that uh, are probably visiting flowers regularly as part of their life cycles. Um, you will see in this table lots of question marks and lots of large numbers um, because we really have very scant evidence on each particular insect species, what they have been doing. And uh, we do need that evidence. We do need to know that. Uh, to give you an example, the, uh, this is a recent study on edible fruit species from the Amazon. Um, the based on the work of uh, many other people, like uh, on about 100 and 60 uh, edible uh, fruit species, the, about half of them are pollinated by native bees, which means that about half of them are not pollinated by native bees. They're actually pollinated by a very diverse array of insects, and most of them are currently unknown. Um, and for those that we do know their names, uh, that we have named already, that uh, we do know, we, re we rarely know their behaviors. We don't know if those insects are visiting just particular plants, if they're pollinating many different plants. And all that information is crucial if we want to understand how such a diverse ecosystem came to be and how to best manage it for the future, for example, to manage those fruit species that could be really important for uh, standing forest wide economy. Um, how can we change this? Uh, just like Leslie showed you uh, with the methods of uh, getting fishes um, from uh, the collecting methods that we do, we can also do that with insects. I've done this. Uh, I've spent a month uh, looking, uh, doing experiments and observing a single uh, species of palm tree in Brazil. And after this month in the field and many more in the, in, the, in the lab, now we know everything I want to know about those insects that were in their flowers. I know uh, which beetles and bees are pollinating, which ones are not. And other people have done similar things. So uh, we can do uh, reviews, uh, literature reviews, uh, like this other one in which we're calling out uh, the community uh, for paying attention to those beetles. But, uh, but really, like, remember, we're talking about millions of species that can scale up. And how can, um, how can we do this? Uh, so if it were to, um, to do this, maybe we can flip the script. So instead of uh, going to a plant and doing experiments and observing, let's rely on all of the insects that have been collected already. And so let's look for a place that has a lot of insects, uh, millions of them. And that uh, it is, uh, those insects, they have been worked, uh, uh, so they have been the subject of work of many people throughout a long period of time. They have been curating them, placing names and organizing as a collection. And then with that, we can look for clues of what they were doing when they were alive, like what plants they were interacting with. And I guess you, you already understood that I, I, I believe the Kew Museum is such a place. So we have many millions of insects, uh, more than 12 million um, to be more precise. The, and we have had a lot of people through history working in our collection, curating it. So uh, we have a, um, a lot of insects with names and uh, they're ready to, to, uh, for me to do this kind of work. 
Um, and they do have clues of what they have been doing before going into the collection. Um, here I'm showing, so this photo was taken by Aline Lira, my student who's here in the audience. Um, and she, um, she's working this kind of beetle that was first described about a hundred years ago. When it was first described, we didn't know anything about them. So we, uh, the person who had those samples, he just had one sample of one beetle from uh, Mexico and he placed a name, put a name on them, and that's it. It took 50 years until the first study in which someone figured out that those beetles were interacting closely with flowers of cecropias. So cecropias are one of the most abundant kind of trees in the American tropics. Like uh, you can't go anywhere and not see a cecropia. And uh, those, those beetles have been there um, all this time and they were not noticed, uh, but uh, someone noticed them. And then it took another 50 years until someone did the first observation and experiments to realize, oh, are they pollinators or not? It seems they are for some species, they're not for others. And, uh, but, but anyway, we don't have 100 years for each insect species. And we don't need 100 years because all along the evidence for this was there. Uh, in this photo, um, we, maybe we can't see that well, but uh, you can see like little dots of a, like a, a bright uh, yellowish uh, dots. The, this is pollen. This is pollen that was collected together with those insects. So we could have looked at this pollen and figure out they are close, they are specialized in cecropias uh, much earlier uh, um, than uh, 100 years. And that's uh, what I uh, intend to do. Uh, so the, since I joined the museum last, uh, last fall, we've been going through the collections and selecting specimens based on uh, uh, a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria and um, including species that we think we know what kinds of flowers they have been visiting and other species that we think we, uh, they never visit flowers, so again, uh, where it gets controls and focusing again on tropical diversity. Um, and we've been organizing this collection and Andrew, who you saw already uh, digitizing fishes, has been uh, digitizing information about those insects, not only their collection data, but also uh, taking photos so we know what they look like uh, when, before we do this work. Uh, the Walder intern that will be, uh, that will start in about a month, will help us to collect the pollen from those insects using very fine uh, jelly, uh, glycerin jelly swabs that do not damage the specimens. And it will do DNA extraction here and send out to the, um, DNA um, Marconi Center at the University of Guelph for sequencing, but we will not only sequence, we'll compare this, we'll get the pollen shells that we get out of this and put them on slides, image them and send to other collaborators who are working on an artificial intelligence to classify pollen based on their morphology. And really what this project is about is to figure out which one works best, which one is easier to do, which one gives us more reliable results so we can really scale this up and discover new pollinators and new infections uh, with our amazing collection in the future. Very briefly, we touched upon the training uh, aim um, when talking about the other two aims. And in total, we'll bring a lot of new people. So uh, we, we had already some, uh, some visitors. So next year, we'll have two other scholars visiting. And now in the summer, we'll have a summer internship program uh, of interns working in the projects we're talking about already, but also other projects like this one led by uh, our head of botany collections, uh, Matt von Horat, with who will do something similar to what I'm proposing with pollen, but uh, with those tiny plants that are also really hard to identify uh, liverworts. Um, with that, um, the I would like to uh, invite everyone. Uh, so this is like the first uh, large scale eDNA, DNA work coding collaborative project in the museum, be, building up on our strengths in collections, research, and action. Um, the, and we started new partnerships that I would like to highlight for the community. We're now members of the International Barcode of Life Consortium, which means we get some perks like discounts to the sequencing with them. And that's not only us, it's available for everyone in the museum, so use it. Uh, and uh, we, had, we had new interns and uh, as Sophie showed you, we already started building some new infrastructure for DNA extraction of sensitive samples. And for the future, we really have to think about the critical role that natural history museums play in this kind of research and that we have to play with our reference collections, with our science expertise, our action. The, 
Uh, and particularly, we, we, we're starting the discussions and we invite more broadly in the discussion in the community about uh, eDNA um, archival. So uh, just like we had fishes and insects here for a hundred years that are enabling work now with new technology, we want to preserve those environmental samples for a hundred years from now. So people with new technology are able to do new things in the future and understand what happened to our in the past uh, 100 years. Um, and of course, continue all those collaborations uh, that we started. I would like to thank nominally uh, Amy Rosenthal, who uh, the former director of the Color Action Center really started this initiative and put this team together. And of course, the Walter Foundation, who uh, made all of this possible and the many, many partners that are involved in all this work. And we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation by uh, our trio of scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure whether the video was taken um, in South America or in Loch Ness. I'm, I'm not excited on this, but I'm sure there are a number of questions. And I, can I ask um, uh, Leslie, Sophie, and Bruno to come up to answer those? Thank you. I'll have to go to Guyana to see the representation. <laughs> Great presentation. A quick question for Sophie. Uh, when you do this uh, eDNA analysis, with these uh, precautions to minimize contamination, do you still detect yourself and, or other, and other humans? Yeah, that's a good question. So with this, um, the primates we were using are vertebrate specific. And so we did detect human DNA. Um, I would say it ranges between 0% sometimes to up to like 25%. Uh, as well, you know, there's it's going to amplify all vertebrates. So we do throw out human DNA. And it could be from the water, right? People are swimming. It could be from the water, from the lab. Uh, but we also throw out, um, you know, cow DNA, dog DNA, cat, a lot of um, that kind of life. Right? It's a, it does. <laughs> and if you've seen the New York Times has an article this week about human DNA in environmental samples, and uh, yeah, so uh, there we are. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was a great presentation. I wanted to ask a little bit about what sampling looks like, uh, whether you're in the Kankakee or in a tropical river. How long does it take to get one sample? What does that look like? How many samples can you get in a day? Um, that's a good question. It so it can be it varies, right? It varies on the pore size of the filter. It varies on the turbidity of the water. Um, and the volume you want to filter. Um, it can be very fast if you're filtering low amounts of water and if the water's clear. I'm talking like five minutes. Um, if the water is very murky, it could also be very fast because the filters clog up really fast. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because DNA will bind to sediment. And so you do get a lot of DNA, you're just not filtering a ton of water. Um, so in Hyper diverse environments, there's one filter um, that I like to use that allows for up to 20 to 30 liters of, of water being filtered. And that takes about half an hour of filtration with the pumps we have for filter. Yeah, so that would be the maximum would be half an hour. Yeah, and I think that, that was just to add to that, that it's part of the methodology um, developing and testing that out that we were trying to do to figure out how to make this the most effective and efficient in places. That was wonderful. Thank you all. My question is about application. So now that you know river dolphins are there, video and everything, you have the eDNA. 
how would you imagine that information being taken up? What would be sort of the ideal scenario for which you could take this information and um, who do you think can take it up and what do you think would be the most effective conservation outcome because of this data you have? So I'll chime in there for developing a partnership with Sardi, which is the South American River Dolphin Initiative. Um, they work closely with IUCN to um, update the IUCN map and distribution. So one part of the work is to update the, the map of their distribution. That's a piece that would allow for just the, the that uh, classification for the river dolphin to be present in Guyana. But then I think what happens next is there is um, an effort by the local people who are interested in sharing this with government to show that this is an important species that you utilizes this waterway um, and, and build on the case that they're already making to protect this landscape. So I think it's kind of having it available broadly, so on IUCN, but also being able to give an army local people and informed government about the presence of the species. They were surprised. I mean, Guyana is a very unique example because it's pretty disjunct. So government, Georgetown and the interior are very, they don't, there's not a lot of interaction. So they weren't very, they were very surprised that they were there. I'll say that for now, but I would say that, that those are some of the next steps. Leslie, along those lines, uh, seems to me that seasonality may be a really interesting thing. I don't know if it applies to river dolphins, but it must certainly apply to some of the fish, don't you think? Absolutely. And um, one of the studies that I did um, in North America using eDNA was to look at seasonality of collecting environmental DNA um, and how that impacts the data that we're able to collect. Um, but you're asking for seasonality in terms of being able to, to show their detections using e eDNA? I'm wondering whether the fish are moving around. Right, right. Exactly. And so collecting in the rainy season is why we want to be able to detect them interior fully into the like flooded savannas and show that they're utilizing those waterways during the rainy season. So we're we're going to mirror that effort that we did in the dry season and the rainy season and the rainy. Sorry, I confused no, your question. <laughs> The season is important. <laughs> I had a quick question. I was wondering to what extent you thought uh, these barcoding efforts might lead to potentially this discovery of new species, species new to science. So I work on <laughs> fungi and have realized our depth of knowledge is very different relative to vertebrates. But in fungi, it's just been a huge benefit to us where we're finding all sorts of species that we'd previously applied one name to and we're finding out something completely different. Even in Chicago, there's been a new mushroom described in the past 15 years. And I'm just curious what you thought about, about that, if that, you might see something like that. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, teeny barfing is super powerful. I, it, it can lead to many. Um, I think it can really help with um, recorded taxa for fish as well. Um, there are a lot of unrecorded fish out there still, right? Um, so I think I think it can be really powerful. And it can also be, you know, if you see that that barcode um, isn't existing and very different from anything that's out there, you can also start investigating, okay, well, let's look at the taxonomy. What else is different? Or um, for instance, that happened to me in French Vienna. I was collecting um, fish and I, I got one sequence of electric fish that was totally different from all the other electric fish in French Vienna. And I had recorded electric signals from these fish, and it turns out the signal is also totally different. Um, so yeah, I think it's super powerful. And to complement on something that I think is between fish and fungi in terms of uh, <laughs> how much you know, yeah. uh, I'll give you a, a specific example. Uh, so last week I was contacted by this journalist of, who, of all things, was interested in writing a piece about what a species is. Of course, like you can't get a taxonomist excited enough to talk about this. Uh, and, I, and I gave her an example of something. Uh, some of those pollinators that I spent a month working on, uh, the main pollinator of that species, turns out it was not the main pollinator. It was two species that even for me as an expert, uh, they look the same. And I only realized they were not the same when I did some DNA barcoding. 
and they were pretty distinct. And then later on, they found other distinctions, including that they might not be equally good pollinators. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, it is really like a, being a cheap and uh, easier tool. I think for, as a first pass, it's really, really uh, important. Um, and uh, we're incorporating this uh, in the work we're doing in the lab uh, at the moment. So yeah, I think it's really useful. I just wanted to add that this really highlights the importance of the DNA reference library. And so having barcodes for as many species as we can in these diverse areas will help us be able to use tools like eDNA and the barcoding um, because for some of the, like the Guyana work, some of those, we got several species that were assigned to a, the same species, but the sequences were different. So is that possibly another species that we just don't have a reference yet for, that we haven't collected? Before and that we don't have DNA for. So, anyway. thank you. Um, thank you again for the, the presentation. Um, I think this is really interesting work. It, it seems like eDNA is pretty sensitive as far as identification of species. I'm also wondering what you can say about the spatial and temporal range for detections. Like, if you detect at a certain Point to say like this species was probably here within the past day, week, month, and so on. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, the in terms of the spatial signature, it's going to vary a lot in current, uh, and so it's it's hard to generalize it. But what studies tend to find is that it's actually really localized. Um, so we tended to think that rivers would have this DNA, you know, like flowing from everywhere, but it tends to be a very localized si signal for studies that have done traditional sampling paired up with eDNA along river continuum. Um, it seems to pair up very well with, with um, within a couple kilometers. In terms of time, um, again, it's going to depend on where you are. Colder waters are going to preserve the DNA longer. In the tropics, we think it's only up to one or two days before you're sampling. So you're getting a very current snapshot. Um, but again, all these are, you know, if you really want to know how the DNA is traveling physically in your river, we have like people like modelers who do like particle modeling and stuff like that, because it's going to depend on turbidity, on temperature, it's going to depend a lot on all these different things in each water body. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Hoban. I'm the conservation biologist at the Morton Arboretum. I hope we get to meet later. Um, so I want to build on the question about the conservation application of the tool. You mentioned using it, of course, to enable local communities and also to update the IUCN map. Um, but you also mentioned in the talk about monitoring. And so I want to ask if the technique is um, affordable enough and uh, use sensitive enough that you could detect changes in like abundance or presence over time, or if you would complement the tool after first detection with, you know, maybe it's better to have on the ground of monitoring for the more frequent, you know, changes in abundance. Yeah, I think one thing that I'll say is that there is monitoring that's going alongside this the eDNA work. It was something that had started when they knew that the presence was pretty um, prevalent in the Guyana watershed. And so there is a monitoring by local people um, that, you know, is limited by funds for boat travel. Um, so it's relatively doable with projects. Um, in terms of, um, so sorry, the second part was the continuing uh, forward. Oh, oh, the sensitivity of the eDNA. Um, in terms of change of abundance year to year, for example. Yeah, and do you want to talk about yeah. the abundance? Because we did get um, portion of DNA at certain sites that were higher than others. So we were able to kind of see the increase um, in the presence of that DNA at a particular site versus another, and then be able to kind of monitor that the time. And I think one thing that goes back to kind of John Bates' question about seasonality is that you know some of these eDNA studies are being used to track movements. If you can kind of be able to kind of see the movement of certain species like migrating patterns of fishes or other organisms like that. But I'll let you add that. 
Yeah, no, uh, just to add, um, quantifying abundance with EDNA right now, it's still hard. So what um, it's really reliable for is present, absent. Um, in terms of abundance, it's gonna depend on many factors like biomass, the time of sampling, um, temperature, a lot of different things. So um, when people wanna do abundance, as Leslie was mentioning, what you can do is you can say, that many percent of reads were assigned to this species. Let's say 50% of all the sequences we got were river dolphin DNA. What that can inform you is it can inform you on the rank abundance. And people have done these studies where they compare fish um, abundances detected from eDNA and, and conventional sampling. What happens is that the rank, so let's say the most common fish species is this one, and that this tends to hold up between both methods. In terms of eDNA, using, using eDNA to um, really tell you there's this amount of individuals that that's, we're not there yet with eDNA. Um, and in terms of sensitivity, if you're really looking for a particular species, um, what you can do is people can do qPCR, which is what Leslie was doing um, when she was doing seasonality work. You collect all this DNA, but you're targeting not just the vertebrate tract, but you're targeting one species. And that's way more sensitive. There's ways to make it more sensitive and ways to make it more um, like inclusive in terms of the economic group. And in terms of portability, it can be very portable. <laughs> um, we've tested many different setups. Uh, we are planning to use it in places where we don't have electricity or um, like fridges or ways to recharge batteries. So um, you can see it's all really, really doable. Um, kind of a very different kind of question. At first, that was a really fascinating presentation and it sounds like a really exciting project. Um, Bruno, I was interested in your comments about uh, BOLD um, and our being a member of the consortium now. What what are the costs associated with that and how what's the discount like? What's the, what's the, what's the actual cost? Yeah. 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 Do you remember the budget? budget? Yeah, yeah. So they, as part of the grant, the grants funding uh, or membership, the, yeah, like $5,000 a year or something. And we get uh, seat, uh, the table for the um, scientific community. Uh, community. Um, and uh, the, on the top of my head, I don't remember now, like the cost of sequencing or how much the discounts are, but uh, they they have this uh, in the website. But I, yeah, I, we can get that information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The difference was big, um, but I, but I don't remember uh, how much. But I can get to you later. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the price either, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to thank everyone for coming and especially thank our three speakers for this presentation. Thank you very much.